Have you ever noticed that many of the key moments in the Bible story happen in gardens? The Bible story begins in a garden in the book of Genesis and ends in a garden in the book of Revelation. Along the way, key moments in the storyline also happen in gardens, the arrest, burial and resurrection of Jesus. The whole story is framed by events taking place in gardens. Isn't that interesting? So in Genesis we read, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. That's Garden One. Eden. It says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. In this garden we have perfect creation, beauty, harmony, where Adam and Eve would walk with God in the cool of the day. But sadly it doesn't last. And we read of the first sin, the archetypal sin that seeds all others as Adam and Eve listen to a voice other than God's. Did God really say, the serpent asks, tempting them to disobey God, that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And so the man and woman eat of the fruit that they had been instructed not to eat. This enthronement of their own and others' voices, this rejection of God's will and way, is like the start of a crack which gets bigger and wider as we journey through the Bible and human history. Adam and Eve leave the garden, but humans go on to vainly seek the wholeness of that first garden in all sorts of different places. God's people seek in military might, in land, in their temple, in the law. Their prophets speak of a time when they will enjoy the shalom of that garden once again. But kings come and go, hopes rise and fall. And over thousands of years, the crack that began in Eden grows to a deep ravine. Until the story weaves its way to another garden and another human confronted with another temptation. This is Garden 2, Gethsemane. We read in John's account, When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples close by. There was a garden and he and his disciples went into it. Once in the garden, Luke continues, Jesus knelt and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And being in anguish, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus knew that the cross lay ahead of him, and he felt fear. One of his disciples offers a way out, raising his weapon, and we could picture the sword in front of Jesus, like the apple was to Adam, there for the taking, promising another way. But where Adam reached and took, Jesus doesn't. In Garden 1 we hear, not your will but mine, as they eat of the fruit. But in Garden 2 we hear, not my will but yours, as Jesus throws himself into the Father's hands. The echo of Eden is clear, the shadow of Eden hangs over the whole scene. This is about that. This garden is about that garden. This is fixing that. And so Jesus is betrayed with a kiss, Gethsemane's kiss of death twisting Eden's kiss of life. He is arrested, tried, mocked, spit upon, abused, whipped and humiliated. A crown of thorns is placed on his head and he is brutally nailed to a wooden cross. In this way, Jesus died. But, as John writes, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb. They laid Jesus there. This is Garden 3, the tomb. 
We read of Mary going to the place where three days earlier they had buried Jesus, along with her hopes, along with her purpose and sense of all that was good and true in the world. Arriving, she finds the tomb empty and it says, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him. In this garden, on dew damp grass, with bright birdsong filling the crisp, early sun ray filled air, the darkness in Mary's own soul begins to come untrue as Jesus stands with her, alive. The scene shimmers with Eden's light. The God who walked in the garden in the cool of the day with Adam, here walks in the garden in the cool of the day with Mary. Mistaking Jesus for the gardener is wonderfully profound. Adam and Eve were gardeners of that first garden. Here is a new Eden, a new beginning, and a new gardener to care for it all. Here is an undoing of the brokenness of Eden and the dark tapestry of sin and death. And here is a redoing of the goodness of Eden, a new creation and better hope. Once again, this is about that. Garden 3 is good news and yet, in various and terrible ways, the crack that began in Eden continues to trace its way through our world, as Jesus said it would for a time. However, in the final chapters of the Bible, there is a picture of the future. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God down the middle of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, and the leaves of the tree offer the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. You see, there is still one more garden to come. Here the picture is of a city, cultivated, developed, but a garden-like city. It is in fact what Eden was meant to become. The tree of life is there, the river of life is there, God is there and the curse is no more. This is Garden 4. It is where the whole story is going, where the brokenness of sin and evil have been removed, where wars and rumours of wars have ceased, where the harmony and wholeness of Eden is restored, where we will walk with God in the cool of the day. Once again, this garden is very much about that garden. From time to time, it's good to visit each of the gardens, to reflect on the beauty and tragedy of the Eden Garden, the remarkable and terrible events of the Gethsemane Garden, the hope and newness of the Tomb Garden, and the promised wholeness of the Future Garden. Eden has weaved its way through history, and it has weaved its way through our own hearts too. Both goodness and sin, life and death, joy and sorrow, peace and war, cracks and beauty, weeds and roses. Our own hearts, like gardens, need tending to. Perhaps Mary's mistake offers the most profound hope for all of us as she turns to Jesus and asks, Are you the gardener?